Welcome to VAMP, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to a night of comedy and aggressive truths. Thank you very much for being here. I'm sure you've noticed by now we're not at our beloved Whistle Stop. We're at our new home here for at least this month, Thorn Street Brewery. So I want to get a round of applause to the bar here. Thank you very much. They're giving us a home tonight. We had a little hiccup, but we pivoted, and now we're here. Tonight is the final show of 2021 which is like functionally indistinguishable from 2020, except we had like a different president, but that's, I don't know. I just hope it doesn't become a trilogy. It's okay, you know, you're here, you're vaccinated, you're boosted, probably, hopefully. So thank you very much for being here. Um, tonight's show, I feel like it's making up for lost time because we didn't have a, uh, a, a final show. We didn't have a December show last year, not a proper one at Whistle Stop like everybody remembers. Um, but this, this summer, the show did return to a limited audience and then a full audience, and the storytellers came back, the crowds came back, and I was just so glad to see this community grow. Like, in just the last year, we added more storytellers to the stage, I feel like, than in, like, the last five. So it's been really awesome to see this community grow. I was once a newcomer, too. I told my first story over, over at the Whistle Stop in December of 2018, about three years to the day. And I had been coming to the show for months and I, you know, I was always watching the stories and, and trying to buck up the courage to submit and I finally did and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because this is a community that helps people tell their stories and tell them better. You're going to hear seven stories tonight from amazingly talented folks, some of whom have never been up here before. And this community helped foster their story and get it ready for the stage and everybody has an interesting story. Even if you don't think your story is interesting, there's somebody out there who does. I mean, just last October, we heard a story about a guy who lost his virginity in a coffin. <laughs> like, if that's not interesting, I don't know what is. Yeah. In fact, you could actually say hi to him back there. He's selling books. <laughs> Give it up. Yeah. So, Again, I want to thank everybody for being here. The community helped, tell, helped me tell my story, and I want to thank you for supporting the storytellers that you're going to hear tonight. That reminds me, we do have a little tradition at the start of every VAMP show. If you feel comfortable, turn to somebody in the audience you don't know and introduce yourself, please. There you go. Look at us fostering community. All right, enough of that, enough of that, enough of that. Thank you. So again, I want to uh, I want to thank Thorn Street for having us. Um, alcohol and storytelling goes together like milk and cookies. The drunker you are, the more entertaining we are. So please, please make sure to get your beers, tip well. We're gonna have an intermission after the fourth story, so make sure you go downstairs and get yourself a drink and support this establishment. All right, so who's ready to hear the final stories of the year? Excellent. All right, we've got a lineup of seven storytellers for you tonight. Things get awkward as Kate McGovern receives an unexpected gift. Kirsten Hernandez takes her shot, while Joe Hudak likes his steak medium rare served with a side of imminent threat. <laughs> After the break, Sarah Sharp stars in her own personal TV show with a very unfinished script. Rory Kelly ducks and dodges dogma at every turn, and Jessica Stevens gets lost in translation. But first, please welcome to the stage our first performer of the night, who is powerless against a mighty mustache, the very funny Jordan Coburn. Thank you. <laughs> I never knew they used prop degrees at college graduation. There I was, a freshly burnt out shining star who'd overworked herself into existentialism like the rest of the disillusioned millennial population. I shared a very expensive stage with that day. I looked out into the crowd and saw my mom's face filled with tears and then a frantic blur that was my dad, scurrying to his seat far from my mom moments before my name was called. He was always on time, but that time was late. 
a characteristic I would inherit. When I was called forward, they didn't even let me keep the prop degree they put in my hand. As we shook with the other, which I imagine was particularly offensive to my dad, the angel investor of this whole charade, They just placed the rolled up piece of paper in my palm for the photo op. I turned and smiled, and then they pulled that piece of paper away, sending me off into real adulthood with what felt like literally nothing to show for it. I had studied political theory, but the pretentious world of academia never felt like it was really for me. Yet since I chose that as the foundation of my future, I knew I needed to get some other experience in college that could actually translate to a job in an environment I could tolerate dare I say, enjoy. Being a music nerd, I found on-campus jobs as a talent booker in front of house tech producing concerts. At a school that's notoriously known for being boring as hell, they used to say UCSD stood for UC Socially Dead. We'd have some surprisingly lit shows, as the kids say, from time to time. A personal favorite of mine being in an Action Bronson show I worked at Porter's Pub where I set up eight wireless mics and hid behind the mixer, turning the monitors up and up and up at their constant request, fighting feedback, as I watched Mr. Action himself call women on stage to participate in the making of what he called an ass witch. <laughs> Which is much more innocent than it sounds, okay? Uh, it was simply the wholesome act of requesting an empowered woman to turn her ass to the crowd, while he and other artistes slapped slices of cold bologna onto her butt and squirted mustard, mayonnaise, and any other self-respecting sandwich maker's go-to condiments all over her ass switch. That's a lot to take in, I know. Though admittedly a low bar, it was certainly the hottest thing I'd seen that night. Until I saw John. He was a backline tech that worked for a private company off campus, bringing mics, drum kits, and speakers to our shows for all kinds of musical acts that didn't travel with their own gear. He was tall, tattooed, lanky, and mysterious. Just how I liked him. A gothic Gumby. <laughs> Even better, he was about 10 years older than me. I found his punk vibe majestic in the older vessel it was contained in. Looking like you don't give a fuck is usually something for the youth, but this guy was so dedicated to apathy, he brought it into his 30s. <laughs> Hot. <laughs> but more importantly, he had a great mustache. An epic, thick, beautiful, broomy mustache. My weakness. <laughs> something that I now know is a sign to run. <laughs> he was the hottest man in the whole fucking world. In every concert I worked, I prayed to the alt gods that his sexy, dressed in black pancake ass would show up <laughs> <laughs> to bend over and drop off some drums and then come back and pick them up. God, it was so hot how we put things down and picked them up. <laughs> On shows that didn't warrant his presence, I fantasized about spilling my beer-filled mug all over our speakers and calling him a tech in distress, begging for his help. Oops, that wasn't an IPA, was it? Better get over here with your physics-defined noodle arms, Mr. John. <laughs> and like a true girl with a crush, despite working so many shifts with him, I was never able to muster up the vocal prowess to even say hello. Not once. My eyes were locked on him, like two magnets stuck on his pierced metal body. But anytime he looked at me, I darted my eyes, and sometimes body, across the room to the furthest point possible, writhing with discomfort. Oh, God, shit, fuck, no, he didn't see me write shit, <laughs> no. You know how it goes. <laughs> okay, it was safe to say I was probably never going to live happily ever after with this man, considering getting a single word out to him was actually impossible. The final show I helped produce of my undergraduate career was a music festival named Sun God a 20,000 people strong music and booze fest, and a public health nightmare. <laughs> About a quarter of the students intending to go to the festival wouldn't even make it to their destination, passing out in bushes <laughs> left and right and flipping off administrators before their final timber. I was tasked with working with administrators to come up with a crowd safety plan that would, hopefully, mitigate the consequences we'd seen in years past. Those efforts were thankfully successful, and the day went on swimmingly. 
As the show came to a close that night and we were all packing up, I looked around to see if John was there, but to no avail. Instead, I would be approached by a man named Sully, a former Marine and head of the private security company we hired to organize our public health strategy at Sun God. He asked me if I'd ever consider going on tour with their company, coordinating crowd safety plans for various music festivals, the first of which would be Warp Tour that summer. I didn't have to think about my answer for a second, okay? 49 days of straight touring with hot, sweaty metal dudes? Sign me the fuck up, all right? <laughs> and just like that, I was in beautiful Pomona. <laughs> Kicking off the first day of the Vans Warp Tour as a fresh out of college baby ginger who knew nothing about the world and nothing about herself or how much sunscreen and bug spray she would need. It's Wontog, New York, it was horrible. I was instantly welcomed with open arms by this crew of traveling misfits and quickly learned that running security on Warp Tour mostly equated to riding in an ATV in the back country of America, smoking weed with my bosses, and occasionally stopping into barricades to make sure local security wasn't letting too many tiny emo kids fall on their heads while crowd surfing. This wasn't a job. This was punk rock summer camp. <laughs> Filled with drugs, sex, and alcohol galore. And it became increasingly clear that what happened on Warp Tour stayed on Warp Tour. Just a complete dream for a young woman who'd suppressed fun in the name of perfection most of her life. The first week flew by, and I was having the time of my life. Nobody fucked with me, or my boss, obviously. <laughs> But that was until the notorious night in Nashville. It was a cool 92 degrees, and I was frolicking back to my tour bus after a long day and a long venue shower, a hot commodity, literally, on tour. I turned the final corner, having said goodbye to my outranking coworkers, who headed to their bus with an espresso machine, and took the final steps to the door of my industrial chariot, when suddenly I heard a lone voice say from behind me, Hey, Red. It was a voice I didn't recognize, but one that spoke to me very fondly, like we'd known each other for a while. Huh? I eloquently blurted as I turned to face the familiar stranger. <laughs> and it was then I realized I'd spoken my first word to the mustached, pancake-assed man, John, the gangle god himself. A combination of terror and lust shot down my legs as I panicked at the sudden realization there was nowhere to run this time. And the moment I'd girlishly longed for was finally here, on a dreamy adventure under the stars in Tennessee. He was even hotter than I could have imagined from before, towering over me with a soft voice and a strong, stupid grin. A perfect candidate for the goofy sweethearts I always fall for. His face was filled with vacant holes of impulse piercings, and he smelled of American spirits. His white tee was tight around the only muscles he'd had for moving heavy gear all day, and his tan, bare ankles bridged the gap from his skinny jeans to his all-black vans, which he, of course, didn't wear any socks with, and I, of course, for some reason, thought that was hot. <laughs> he was the most titillating combination of mystery and grit to my 22-year-old self, and I couldn't stop gawking at him. Until that night, I had no idea he knew who I was, and here we were together alone somehow. I snapped out of it. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> I snapped out of it, <laughs> like that just did for all of us, um, enough to finally give him a proper reply to his initial greeting. Hey. Fancy seeing you here, says the sexy Babadook. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck, I said. Even in the most romantic situations, I still talk like an irreverent monster. Um, you worked at UCSD, I recognize you, I said. His adorable smile got even bigger as his cheeks pushed his eyes into an endearing almond shape. Yeah, I recognize you too. I'm really happy you're on tour. I've always wanted to talk to you, but was too nervous. 
okay, at this point, my brain is just freaking out, okay? I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. What the fuck is happening? What? Like, this is heat stroke, right? Yes, not real, okay? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I said. <laughs> in no way reflecting the chaos in my mind. Me too. Can we take a walk, he says. Sure. We step in line with one another and start walking as slow as slow can go both wanting the scene to last as long as it possibly could. We got to small talking, but not to get to know each other, just to hear each other's voices. It felt like we already knew each other. We allowed the pauses between our answers and questions to linger, using the gaps in speech to look over at one another, silently smiling, both in disbelief that these two secret admirers had found themselves in the beginning of a perfect love story. It was at that point that I coyly looked down towards the ground for a moment, and that's when I saw his ring. And I wish I could tell you that that's where the story ended. <laughs> What's that? I said. Naively, I prayed for an answer that would even remotely indicate anything other than the obvious. He looked at me, smiled, and sighed quickly, somehow dropping his shoulders and shrugging them at the same time. He pursed his lips together and filled his cheeks with air, taking way too long to speak for a man who should have had an answer for this. He was not a smooth criminal. Well, he started, we're not good, stuff's been really bad. I rolled my eyes, but made the stupid decision to let them land back on him again. Mm-hmm, I said, channeling all the sass my mother had ever modeled for me. <laughs> I don't expect you to believe me, but she's mean, Jordan, like, really mean. I mean, the things she says to me, nobody should ever have to hear those words, and she does it in front of our kid. Jesus, you have a kid, too? <laughs> I do, he smiles again, and she's the best. And I can't let her grow up in that. It's ending. It's over. It's done. <laughs> what John didn't know is that in that moment, he was telling me almost verbatim the exact words my dad had said when he had cheated on my mom, ending our family 20 years ago. An act my dad wouldn't own up to for decades, and at best could only acknowledge by mustering up the words, mm, I probably could have ended things better. It was like a sick sequel presenting itself to see if I'd gained the wisdom and self-respect to not buy it this time around. But I was too young and dumb and too stuck on the belief that belief itself was enough to change reality. John and I spent the rest of the summer on Warp Tour engaging in a shameful love affair. And I, the whole time, pushed away the debilitating weight of the moral consequences of my decision. I can't say I didn't think that what we had was real. And I can't say we didn't have an insane amount of fun traveling the country together in a Bud Light-driven fantasy world. <laughs> but recounting it now with any real fondness would be like telling you that hell wasn't hot. It was really fun, but there would be scars. You don't get to lay dormant while the world is burning just because the fire is warm. And certainly not when you were one of the arsonists. But for the time being, I was avoiding thinking too much about all that because I somehow thought he was falling in love with me. And then Columbus, Ohio happened, the day that his wife came to visit him on tour with his baby. He didn't tell me this would be happening. He also didn't correctly depict his relationship with his wife. Shocker. I saw his beautiful wife holding their beautiful baby embrace John with all the love in the world and I saw John lovingly receive it with the same full, warm smile I had grown to love that summer. His innocent baby girl embodied their brightest collective features, and the light she brought to the world was only intensified when all three of them were together. The moment I recognized this, I can say with certainty, was the most rock-bottom, confused, kill-me-now-I'd-rather-be-banished-to-a-ditch moment I've had in my life. I felt like some stupid dog that was tricked into chasing a ball that was never actually thrown, only to stumble back to the starting point, humiliated. John would soon find me that day and tell me that it was over, 
that tour was ending and this was fun and I'm a great person, yada, 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 fuck you, fuck me, it was all done. And I'd spend the last couple of weeks on tour dealing with all the I told you so's from people I called friends and the she's such a sluts from the people I did not. Either way, I deserved it all. It's fitting the affair blew up in a city named Columbus. I thought I could claim something that wasn't ever mine. But obviously, that's never the case. There are a few things I've done in life that I wish I could erase, and that bring me such a level of shame, I can't even believe that version of Jordan exists at some point on this space timeline. And while in the moment I justified to myself why everything was okay, the feeling of how not okay it was only got worse over time. And I don't know how to fix that. I ask myself often, why the fuck did you do that? Aren't you a good person? I can probably answer the second part of that question, but I'm still working on believing it. That was Jordan Coburn! Have you ever had to manage 30 feral cats covered in glue and glitter? Because that's what teaching elementary school in December is like. Kids are excited, preoccupied with Santa, and not wanting to do much work. Teachers are desperately trying to keep the class focused while finishing up tests and projects. It's an abnormal month of school. You are encouraged to have fun crafts and holiday experiences, all while trying to meet the academic requirements thrust upon you. Teaching conjunctions to a room full of kids on ugly sweater day is like trying to put Christmas pajamas on a cat in heat. <laughs> Christmas gifts are the only bonuses we receive. Over the years, I've received many presents, usually cheap boxes of chocolate. I'm looking at you, Russell Stover. $5 Starbucks cards, coffee mugs that say, world's best teacher. So basically gifts I would never choose for myself. Too often the gifts were apple-shaped ornaments with my name and the school year printed on them. If I wanted a tree full of monogrammed ornaments, I'd go work for Pottery Barn. <laughs> I don't mean to sound ungrateful. It's the thought that counts, right? But what kind of... What kind of thought is a popcorn tin that expired last February? <laughs> or a Red Lobster gift card that has $12.71 left on it? <laughs> True story. <laughs> the worst teaching day in December is the last day before winter break. That final week is a teacher's nightmare. Kids are hyped up. Flu season has begun. Haha, <laughs> flu. Oh, God. Love that. <laughs> Love that old guy. Um, and someone in administration thinks it's a great idea to have pajama day. If I wanted to see 35 kids in their grungy pajamas, I'd join a community theater production of Oliver Twist. <laughs> the saving grace of the last day before winter break was our lunchtime. Teachers rushed to the staff lounge for a sliver of sanity and a break from students. The lounge was just a drab room where teachers could vent, swear, and discuss where our next happy hour was. <laughs> the lounge in December was full of Christmas candy, homemade treats, and laughter. At lunch, teachers brought their best, worst, and most ridiculous gifts to show off to each other. A favorite of mine was a mug that read, It takes a big heart to teach little minds. <laughs> On the flip side, there were teachers who received beautiful, sentimental notes that they read aloud to the group. Now and then, someone would receive an extravagant item, a large amount of cash or a luxury store gift card. One year, I was gifted an assortment of cheeses. I always joked in class about how much I loved cheese, and this student clearly listened. <laughs> The gift suited me perfectly. 
But in the lunchroom, we had the most fun sharing the weird gifts, the ones that elicited the most laughs. On one such December school day, a sweet, quiet student named Kayla handed me a Victoria's Secret gift bag. <laughs> I was used to Rudolph, Santa, even a Walmart bag, but not Victoria's Secret. Kids would often say, you can open it now, if they were excited about the gift. I usually declined, not wanting to take up class time or make students who did not have gifts feel bad. I stood there holding my Victoria's Secret bag in front of 35 first graders. A few of the boys started chanting, open it, open it. I quickly went on the offensive and said, thanks Kayla, I can't wait to open it on Christmas. She smiled and skipped away. After dropping my students off at lunch, I had to see what was in the Victoria's Secret bag. I assumed there would be an ugly coffee mug nestled in some tissue paper. Instead, I pulled out an ornament. It was a clear ball ornament with a black feather boa around the top. Inside the ball was a trial-sized bottle of Victoria's Secret Very Sexy For Her perfume. The liquid inside appeared darker than any perfume I knew. Perhaps a Victoria's Secret angel had replaced the perfume with bourbon. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to smell it or drink it, but it was perfect to share in the staff room at lunch. I burst into the lunchroom and said, wait till you see what I got today. I held up my very sexy ornament. My friends looked at the sexy perfume their eyes darted back and forth between the ornament and me. <laughs> Altogether, they burst out laughing. If you think elementary teachers are sexy, you're either too old you, you don't remember elementary school, or you've watched some deeply problematic porn. <laughs> What kid gave you that gift, my friend and teaching partner Nikki asked. Take a guess. Nikki and the other teachers were ready with their lists of suspects. Was it Chad? Didn't his dad hit on you, Kate? Not Chad. And yes, his dad hit on me. I know, it was Dylan. The kid who wrote about going to Hooters every Sunday? Nope, not Dylan. My friend Jen called out. Oh, I know, it's from that one mom whose boobs are always falling out of her shirt. <laughs> Wrong again. I told them it was from Kayla's family. Kayla, Nikki said, but she's so quiet and shy. All the teachers speculated as to why Kayla's family chose this gift for me. Was there a gift with purchase at Victoria's Secret? Was this where they did all their Christmas shopping? Did someone in the family think for some creepy reason that I was sexy? <laughs> Nikki took my ornament and held it up. What parent would let their six-year-old pick out this kind of perfume? And then it hit me. My own parent would. When I was six years old, I wanted to do my own Christmas shopping, but only for my mom. Being the youngest of three kids, I was constantly teased and tortured by my big brother and sister, so clearly I would not be getting gifts for them. <laughs> my dad offered to take me shopping for my mom. We went to Sibley's, the oldest department store in our city. My dad followed me around the store as I looked for the perfect gift. I brought my mo own money, which was definitely not enough for anything in Sibley's, but my dad let me look at scarves, sweaters, and jewelry. When we came to the perfume counter, I saw the most beautiful, tiny bottle of perfume. I asked my dad if I could get that for mom. He smiled and said yes. The perfume was Sex Appeal by Joe Vaughn. <laughs> I don't know how my dad did not burst out laughing as the woman behind the counter wrapped my Christmas gift. I also don't know how my mom hid her bewilderment when she opened it Christmas morning. 
And clearly it took more than a few martinis for Jovan's ad team to come up with their slogan that year, which was, someone you know wants it. Each time my parents were going out or having a dinner party, I would ask my mom if she was wearing my perfume. <laughs> she would say yes, but the bottle always looked full to me. She kept the bottle on a curio shelf she had in my parents' bedroom. It stayed there far too long. When I was 14, I spotted the bottle on the shelf and remembered it was from me. I read the name on the bottle. Hoping to hide my mother's sex appeal forever, I shoved it behind a ceramic squirrel. <laughs> when I finished the, telling this story to the lunchroom, there was a long, silent pause. Well, can't top that, Nikki said. The bell rang, signaling the end of lunch. Only one more hour of classroom chaos before the start of winter break. I took all my gifts home and placed them under my tree. My apartment now looked more festive, having presents where there were none. I hung my very sexy ornament on the tree to catch the eyes of my visiting friends. <laughs> so why would Kayla's mom let her choose this gift? Perhaps she was shopping with her mom and saw the very sexy ornament and asked her mom to buy it for me. She too was six years old. Maybe it was her first time picking out gifts. Very was a word she could read, but sexy wasn't on our first grade reading list. <laughs> Maybe she just saw a pretty ornament for a teacher she admired. Perhaps her excitement for the ornament, for buying a special gift, was the same as mine when I was six. My teacher friends and I continued our tradition of sharing ridiculous gifts. Every teacher, especially in December, needs comic relief. It's better to give than to receive is such a cliche, but perhaps it's true. I'm sure I was more excited about giving sex appeal to my mom than she was to receive it from me. And the same was probably true for Kayla. Whether she picked out my very sexy gift herself or just delivered it to me, she enjoyed the act of giving. I bet she gave her teacher a gift each year after that, maybe from Victoria's Secret, but probably not. My parents don't even recall the sex appeal perfume, but I remember. I remember what it was like to feel happy, proud, and loving, giving a special gift, no matter how ridiculous it seems now. And that feeling lingers far longer than the scent of any cheap perfume. That was Kate McGovern. as we walked up the jagged sidewalk to the house. God, oh my God, that is enough out of you. Outwardly dismissing the idea, but inwardly, maybe she wasn't too far off. That night was the annual Sigma Chi Christmas party. And unlike most years, however, this wasn't the typical shindig featuring Rudolph-themed wallpaper covering the whole punched walls and at least one man in a dick in a box costume. It was a little bigger than that. This night was the night I knew Bryce, the boy I'd been talking to for the last few weeks, would ask me to be official. I knew it in my gut, and even though I was really excited, I was really fucking nervous. <laughs> All my friends seemed to be over the dating thing already, and my roommates were just happy to get someone to get me out of their hair. The only assistance available on the subject was on the internet, specifically on WikiHow. And uh, even though I didn't know a lot, I didn't uh, think this, this was it. <laughs> so I decided to go it alone. After we arrived at the party, the house was already bumping with the sound of trap music and drunk horny freshmen. Through the backyard gate, sloppily adorned with Christmas lights and dollar store tinsel, Bryce popped around the hot cocoa peppermint schnapps station, grinning broadly and decked out in a Santa hat and a Star Wars Christmas sweater. Where are you headed? He asked, 
locking me in embrace two seconds too long just to be friendly. Probably going for a beer, why? Don't drink that, hang here for a second, he said as he darted off into the residence suite. I stared at the vacant spot where he stood with rosy red cheeks and a symphony roaring in my chest. I wasn't a girl that boys liked, or at least I was told that I wasn't. After, being, after a year of being told by my sorority sisters and a lifetime of being told by my parents that everything about me was inherently unattractive, it took me by surprise that this dirty blonde freckled face with a revolving wardrobe of band t-shirts took an interest, especially when no one else did. In the weeks of isolation that was fall semester, it felt good to be with someone who would take me craft beer shopping with this fake ID and sit on my carpet playing my worn down copy of Is This It on my Victrola until my roommate screamed, if I hear last night one more goddamn time, I'm gonna kill myself. <laughs> I just turned it up. <laughs> as soon as he was out of sight though, another less friendly voice appeared behind me. What are you doing here? I turned around and saw the sight of my friend and IRL shame wizard Colin staring blankly with his arms crossed. He was in a weird fucking mood. Jesus, nice to see you too. He offered me a can of Frat's Finest Piss Beer until I told him who I was waiting for. You're, uh, you're still on that? I mean, I live with a guy. Uh, you can do better. Trust me. Before I could ask what the hell that meant, Bryce reemerged with a bottle in one hand and an opener in the other. I got you a coffee stout. I figured you might be interested. He began giddily listing off the brewer, the bitterness rate, and the refinery process like he was on the goddamn taproom payroll. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I lied. I'm fucking allergic to coffee. <laughs> but he was so fucking cute, I decided to roll with it. Should I go get a red cup? Why, are you afraid I have cooties? He asked before taking a sip. I'm fine with cooties. I said with confidence seemingly pulled out of my asshole as I grabbed the bottle from his hand and took an ostentatious glug. Hives, my friends? I hear are temporary. He stared with a half smile for a few seconds until he finally interrupted his self-imposed silence. You're impressive, you know that? Trying to keep my protruding smile contained, I handed the bottle back and took a few moves towards the basement steps. For the first time in my life, I was the object of desire, and I knew exactly what I wanted with this newfound power. I was queen of the motherfucking world, and it was time to get the queen some shots. <laughs> After a few minutes, we got torn into differing party tides. About an hour and a half went by without seeing him. <laughs> Even though I didn't want to be a clinger, I spent every conversation, every round of beer pong, and every dance off wondering where he was. He hadn't tried to find me, but I mean, that's fine, right? We all have our own friends. I mean, he'll come back. I know it. Feeling the tidal wave of liquor I had been anxiously drinking begin to crash down on me, I, stood, I slid down the wall to sit by myself. I saw the stares of friends and acquaintances that stood around me, and although I dismissed it as drinking judgment, they felt a little different. I couldn't pinpoint how, but they all moved in the same motion. They looked at me, they rotated their heads to a fixed point in the crowd, and then looked at each other. A strangled gasp of dread began to take root. My hyperfocus was broken until Colin stood above me, stone-faced. I think it's time that you went home. I'm not that fucked up. I'm fine. I shot back, annoyed at the shady bullshit he had been pulling all night. Like, was the thought of someone liking me so inconceivable that like it couldn't be true to him? Like, was did he think that I was crazy? It's not, it's not that, it's just, I'm taking it home. We can talk about it in the morning. He reached out his hand, gesturing for me to rise up. I rolled my eyes, and as I stood to get away from him, I saw Bryce across the room. His pale hands up the skirt of a girl in a latex Mrs. Claus costume, as their mouths lashed onto each other for dear life. The whole room was looking at me. 
half of them with pity and half of them in anticipation. It was like the oxygen was being sucked directly out of my lungs. Colin put his hand on my shoulder. I'm taking you home. I began to gain deep grasp for air, fighting the urge to gag in front of what felt like every human I had ever met in my entire life. I mean, it made sense, right? She's her, straight-haired and slender and beautiful and the type of girl I imagined every guy would dream of having. And I'm me, the Hermione-haired virgin in straight jeans, too pathetic to walk in a straight line without tripping over my goddamn shoelaces. I was fucking kidding myself if I thought that I can compete with that. As I turned to the door, though, I was overtaken by another thought. Was that girl the one who stayed up with him until two every night, talking on the phone? <laughs> Did she know that when he was five, he secretly wanted to be a dinosaur when he grew up, or that he likes watching K-dramas to go to sleep? Does that girl know what he dreams about, what his fears are? Does she give a shit? Like I do. I was going to show him that I was good enough for him. I was going... <laughs> to show him that he should love me. And if waiting around for him to figure that out is what it took, I guess it was something that I was willing to do. I stomp over to the bar, throwing back another tequila shot. Colin left. I didn't see him for the rest of the night. Bryce finally met up with me again, cherry red lipstick smudged across his face as he invited me to go sit up on the rooftop with him. Climbing up on the panels, we saw hundreds of people that littered the property, but we were far above the noise. It felt like I could breathe again, at least just for a little bit. Your, uh, your shirt is pretty great. I say with a little less confidence than before, gesturing towards the Christmas-themed Death Star. He laughed as he clumsily spilled his entire drink on the head of an unfortunate below. So uh, are we going to go see Rogue One after finals? I don't know, that, uh, that sounds like a date. I slurred as we both laughed. Part of me had begun to sober up, however. Did you just ask me on a fucking date? Like, like after that? <laughs> we sat atop the roof until about 1.30, last call. He invited me down for the final round. Before getting to the stairs, he turned around and reached his hand out to help me. I gladly obliged his gentlemanly offer, but when we got to the bottom of the steps, he didn't let go. In the nearly empty basement, I was holding hands with him. He wanted to hold my hand. I finally broke off our grasp when the DJ began playing All I Want for Christmas, a song that no human in the world can resist. Right? Is it just me? Okay. <laughs> At this point, at least in my mind, the only two people in the basement were us, as we flailed around to the tune, letting the green and red lights reflect off the wrapping paper wall and bounce off our faces. I knew this was the end of the song, and I knew that the end of the night was approaching, too. I needed to do something, and I finally thought that I had enough signs that the feelings were at least somewhat reciprocated. As Mariah Carey sang her last, you I point to him, smiling and singing into an imaginary microphone as I continued to dance. Nothing mattered anymore. The red flags, the doubters, the other skanks. I was in bliss. I just wanted to stay there, just for a minute. He stood still and stared at his feet. As the song ended, silence took over, and only when he grasped my shoulder did I begin to fall down to earth. Can I, uh, can I talk to you outside? I followed him through the great gate onto the green belt, about 15 feet from the house. His mouth began to move, but I wasn't listening to the words coming out. The cold mascara tears began to stream down my face as party stragglers stared at me like a zoo animal through the iron fence. <sighs> it felt like he talked for what was an eternity, but the only thing I can think about was my confusion. He eventually walked away, and after a few minutes of emotion and temperature-triggered frozenness, I walked home. 
After laying in bed for several hours, unable to go to sleep, my phone buzzed several times to find seven green text messages. I contemplated deleting them without opening, sending them straight to the fucking trash where they probably belonged, but my curiosity got the best of me. Hey, I know I'm probably the last person you want to talk to right now, but I just want to say how sorry I am for last night. You're the best friend I have, and I don't want anything to happen to that. I'm terrified of losing you. I'm so sorry. After staring at my screen for another two fucking hours, I shut my brain off and let my thumbs type the message that opened the door to a year of lies, deception, and emotional battery. So like, if I forgive you, does this mean we can still see Rogue One? Give it up for Kirsten Hernandez. I couldn't figure out what the bald guy's tattoo was supposed to be. Baldy was seated at the table across from me and seven other armed special forces guys, and he had some type of winged creature tattoo on his chest, perhaps a nod to his Bolivian ancestry. The faded black wingtips crawled out of his shirt and seemed to threaten strangulation. The wait staff materialized with enough liquor to loosen every stiff collar. They attended both our tables with the gusto reserved for large groups of government employees who were clearly going to use taxpayer money to cover the evening. At a three to one exchange rate, the restaurant stood to make a windfall. The senior DEA agent from my table was talking to Baldy. He was the only guy at his table speaking English. The other four goons created a huddled mass of black denim and leather jackets muttering amongst themselves. I nervously watched their hands in the corner of my eye, not totally sure of who they were or their intentions, but I was sure that they were also packing heat. I shifted in my chair and my sidearm rustled under my windbreaker. This was my third deployment to South America. I had been unable to get to Afghanistan. Iraq hadn't even kicked off yet. I was partnered with Mel. Seven years older than me, he always reminded me of Danny DeVito's penguin character from Batman Returns. <laughs> Mel was a Puerto Rican with a speech impediment that made his English and Spanish equally unintelligible. <laughs> this was our first chance to work with the senior operators and the boss. Mel and I had never been to Bolivia before, but we picked up on the nuances of counter-narcotics work pretty quick. The mission was simple, but the tasks were abundant, varied, and spread throughout the country. I went to Bolivia to work with the DEA, leading the charge against the coca growers in that little part of the world. Mel had more years in the military than I did, but what he had in experience, he lacked in perspective and mental flexibility. <laughs> Mel and I were enjoying what appeared to be marginal competency in working drug busts, usually unsupervised ones. I assumed our dinner meeting with the DEA agents was to update mission progress and make any necessary changes. La Estancia was one of the most expensive steakhouses in Bolivia. The wait staff buzzed around us like hummingbirds on a porch feeder in the summertime. The Fogo de Chao in downtown San Diego would have been a distant second to the food and service in that restaurant. We ate like kings who hadn't seen civilization in too long. I was just trying to end the meeting and the dinner so I could get back to the hotel. I could feel the meat sweats coming on. <laughs> I only knew that the restaurant meeting was with the DEA. Although one does not strap weaponry under one's clothing to attend a dinner meeting, not expecting company. I watched as a group of four goons walked in and heading directly for our meeting. Baldy led the way, the inky wingtips emerging from his shirt like daggers. Adrenaline coursed through me and my pupils dilated before I even understood. The hunched posture of the goons, a few hidden hands, instantly the meat sweats evaporated. I sized them up, most hands where I could see them bulges in the same places on their coats. The goons behind Baldy mirrored my actions. I wondered who in the room would die first. Noting the tension, the DE, senior DEA agent crossed in front of our table and met with Baldy. Shaking hands, they sat to my right at the only other table in the back of this restaurant. Oh shit, this dinner wasn't meeting, wasn't chance. DC is busting my balls here, I need something for the cameras, quipped the DEA guy trying to be nonchalant. Baldy understood. 
times are hard for us, senor. You have already jailed so many of our couriers. The DEA guy backpedaled. Well, your Bolivian military police are getting better at their own investigations, he said. With very few Americans in Bolivia, all the counter-narcotics work was done with and through local military police and other networks, and rarely above board. Our guests could have been from anywhere. That's when the bald guy dropped the big one. You will need to let our shipment get through then. He was calculated, curt, and non-negotiable. My mind careened. I'm sorry, what the fuck? <laughs> was this guy a tango, and did he just secure a drug shipment with a guy from the fucking DEA? A guy that was, was, was supposed to be on my team? The 51% rule states to do what 51% of the room is doing, and you'll be fine. I was pretty tipsy at that point. Everyone looked chill. The senior operators across the table took note of the conversation and barely blinked. I shot a concerned look to my left at my boss. He gave me a calm stare. I relaxed, grateful to not go all John Wick on a full tummy. <laughs> the DEA flashed a toothy grin to both tables in an attempt to de-escalate the tension. Mel was the only guy visibly uninterested in de-escalation. <laughs> Everything was black and white with him. We joked that spending all that time in the conventional world had handicapped him it handicapped his ability to work in our industry. And there I was, sitting next to him, also having to come to grips with the fact that the world is just shades of gray. The idea of right and wrong, black and white, fell away as suddenly as walking backwards off a cliff at night. I joined the Army in the mid-90s to alleviate human suffering worldwide. <laughs> I watched the news I watched the news cameras show Black Hawk Down live in 93. I saw our troops try to make Mogadishu a safer place and their corpses were dragged through the streets. I thought I could do better. I thought I could really help. The towers fell as I was earning my Green Beret. Seeing the DEA wheel and deal with the very targets I was sent to interdict early on in my career sent me sideways. The bureaucratic structures in place make it so that no one's singular person can change it. As a lone soldier, I, I had no way to affect my situation. As much as I wanted to save the world, the powers that be had the upper hand and I was stuck. I looked down at my empty rum glass. I could have asked for another and the waiter would have delivered it. But as my idealism started to fade, I figured the best thing to do would be to switch to water and things how, watch how things unfold. Mel, on the other hand, didn't handle the disruption to his monochromatic worldview well. He drank more, and he started to piece together who our guests were and where they fell in his own personal hierarchy of good and evil. He began subtly suggesting that we should detain, if not arrest, the entire group. <laughs> the boss reminded Mel with a tone and a glance that made it clear that there would be no further discussions, that we had no arresting authority in the country, and the rules of engagement prevented any type of overt aggression without any provocation. As the rum continued to impede the effectiveness of Mel's executive center in his brain, his eyes darted between the goons at our, and our table. He realized the futility of arresting the gentleman at the next table. He began nervously shifting in his chair and the two pound metal bulge under his coat knocked against it. The Beretta M9 felt heavy under my arm as well. The 14 rounds in the magazine plus the one round in the chamber always seemed to double the weight. With the tritium sights and the trigger weight reduced from 15 pounds down to six, meant that Mel and I would have significant advantage with the first shots. I lost track of the hands of the two, goon, two goons. They were staring straight at Mel. Was I the only dude seeing this? Another operator on my team elbowed me in the ribs to let me know that it was Mel's bedtime. <laughs> Check, please! I could feel the goons watching us as I took Mel outside for some fresh air and a fresher perspective. In the parking lot, the high mesas of Cochabamba greeted us with a pleasantly cool breeze that added oxygen to our thoughts. The sunset behind the mountains cut a light show of orange and red hues through the surrounding trees. I dumped Mel into the back seat of the Ford Ex uh, armored Ford Explorer. He treated it like a pulpit as he doled out his sermon. Dirty ass politicians have no place in the drug war, he slurred at me. They don't want to win, they'd be out of work. They're clearly on the take. My worldview similarly battered, I shared his disdain, and we tried to piece it together. 
dude, that is a bold accusation without solid proof. I don't have the macro view on this and neither do you. There's a lot of weird shit that happens down here. I replayed the events in my head and, try, and I struggled. There were too many questions unanswered. Like what, Mel said. Coño, pendejo, I have no idea, I replied. <laughs> There's always thugs wanting to put the cops on their rivals. You know the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I heard the sound of my words, but I wasn't sure I believed it. Bullshit, primo, was all he could muster as his breathing became rhythmic and the snoring started. I spent three and a half years on that untenable mission. Long time in the drug war for nada. Three and a half years in five countries working with local military and law enforcement units. Three and a half years running around on taxpayer money trying to validate our existence without actually solving anything. And the hard truth of it was, at the same time, Afghanistan was a hot mess and Iraq was about to kick off. We all wanted to go play in those sandboxes with their relaxed rules of engagement. As the wars in the Middle East ramped up, the South American trips became more of a working vacation between Iraq and Afghanistan. And due to operational constraints, I was never able to discuss what happened with my leaders. Specifically, shortly after our dinner, the Bolivian president and vice president waged a civil war using the military and police units that we were using with the DEA. My team holed up in a hotel for three weeks while the civil war progressed. And the Civil War ended with both politicians losing to the actual power broker, Evo Morales. The head of the Drug Makers Union was elected president of Bolivia. <laughs> yep, there was a Drug Makers Union in Bolivia. Because when it came to logistics and organization, narcos made Jeff Bezos look like an amateur. If this was how the governments and their leaders were going to run, uh, operate while we waged the war on drugs, I sure as hell didn't need to get all uh, sideways over a sketchy dinner party. I tossed, a, <laughs> I tossed a couple of Tylenol on the hotel breakfast table for Mel the next morning. I knew that the work in South America wasn't ever going to get the results that were hoped for, and neither was I. You good, primo? I asked. Fuck it, let's go to work, was all he could muster. That was Joe Hudak! What'd y'all think of the first half? Let's get another round of applause for Jordan, Kate, Kirsten, and Joe. Now please welcome to the stage our next performer making her vamp debut, Sarah Sharp. When Zoom became my classroom, I imagined myself as the host of my very own television show, 11th grade English with Miss Sharp. Fluidly instructing, peppering my lessons with jokes met with wide applause, and sharing information that would bring my student audience to tears of gratitude. <laughs> but here's the thing with audiences. You can see them. When your wit is on full display, you can see the range of reactions. They smirk, smile, maybe nod in acceptance of the information you're offering. On Zoom, you don't get that, especially when the cameras are off. At the start of the pandemic, many school districts adopted a policy to allow students to turn their cameras off during Zoom instruction. The purpose was to keep students from feeling uncomfortable about where and how they lived. A broom closet in a two-bedroom apartment doesn't have the same social currency as a Rancho Santa Fe pool house. I supported not requiring cameras, but I don't think many parents, regardless of what neighborhood they lived in, considered how it felt to be a teacher speaking to a largely faceless void. which I found surprising because everyone saw how awkward every late night show became without an audience. <laughs> At the end of the day, my face was sore from my exaggerated expressions. I was a marionette, spinning and sparkling for the students, so they had something to entertain them during the hours they were locked down in their homes. I made my Zoom background a picture of the real classroom we weren't in in an attempt at normalcy. It was all a lie. 
During most lessons, I popped into a breakout room to see how things were progressing. Instead of interrupting a lively conversation about the rhetorical analysis of Hamlet's final soliloquy, <laughs> I was greeted with blank screens and muted mics. I found I developed the uncanny ability to call out to those who were not with us and summon them from the void. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel. I called out like a medium bidding the dead to appear. Are you with us, Daniel? <laughs> Daniel was with us, at least spiritually. Uh, yeah, sorry, miss, my mic wasn't working. I was always amused when I could hear the keyboard through a student's mic as they typed, my mic isn't working. <laughs> Funny how the pandemic brought to light an epidemic of malfunctioning mics. I bowed out of the room to allow new threads of communication to flow, knowing full well the disembodied voices I had summoned would go back to wherever they came from. The curriculum I had painstakingly planned for the day wouldn't matter because the only thing that would occur would be the viewing of hundreds of TikToks. <laughs> Social media would have me believe a color-coordinated classroom with fun posters is the key to good teaching. I mean, shit. All I had to do was rewrite the lyrics to a hip-hop song, and I could have wound up on Ellen. Yeah. Why was I here? I was in the last year of my 20s, and I had a solid career ahead of me, but I felt like an imposter. I entered the teaching job market in the spring of 2016. My school district hired me, even though, during my interview, I couldn't coherently answer the question of why I wanted to become a teacher. <laughs> The only thing I felt confident about in my interview was my outfit. I wore my power color. And I let my smile reach my eyes, hoping I'd connect with the panel of administrators, desperately trying to fill the massive gaps in their teaching roster. Fortunately, I managed to recover from the initial stumble and presented myself as someone who could do this job and maybe even thrive in it. Now it was December of 2020, and there I was, on Zoom, watching the condensation form on my wine glass, as my students did, or at least pretended to do, 20 minutes of silent reading. <laughs> that was one of the perks of teaching from home. I could throw back a Pinot Grigio during a long, leisurely lunch before my, <laughs> before my sanity walks around my neighborhood. Sometimes, my boyfriend emerged from his all-hands meeting, hoping for some late afternoon action. That was another perk. I boot up my next class ready to re-engage my smile, hoping my students' internet connection would hold long enough so they could see it reach my eyes. In January, my district began talking about a hybrid learning model, half in person, half on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> the parent pressure to get students back in the classroom was mounting. At the monthly school board meetings, parents had three minutes each to share any thoughts or ideas with the board about these issues. 30, <laughs> 30 or more parents digitally lined up to vent their frustrations with current education while the board members just sat there and took it. After a day of spinning around on Zoom for my students, I watched the board meeting on my laptop where the denizens of affluent neighborhoods demanded teachers return to the classroom. I wasn't fully paying attention. Instead, I had my phone at arm's length exchanging memes with my coworkers. I began to feel a kinship with the students who did the same thing during my lessons. The memes weren't much help. Those parents seemed to be trying to convince everyone that everything I had done thus far during the pandemic wasn't worthy of a salary. Endless to-do list, mandatory meetings that offered no guidance, daily emails to their failing students who hadn't appeared in class in weeks. My efforts weren't always working, but I still thought, contrary to what many of those angry parents believed, I deserved to get paid for it. My therapist advised me to stop attending those meetings. <laughs> I reminded myself that it was only a few obnoxious parents who thought I should be out of a job. It wasn't every parent. But that's when they organized themselves. 
they created Facebook groups to share their opinions of what schools and educators should be doing to help their kids. They formed legal coalitions to sue districts and state governments. And they posted videos of us teaching on Zoom to prove what shitty teachers we were. <laughs> Oh, just wait. <laughs> the first week of hybrid learning was rough. Half of my students in class behind plexiglass shields and half at home barely paying attention on Zoom. It felt like splitting my body in half with a butter knife. A couple of weeks into the new model, I returned home and got a call from my best friend as I cracked open a white claw. She didn't even bother to say hello, just launched straight into it. Did you hear about Lori, she said? She's on Fox News. I pulled up Google News on my laptop. There was my colleague, Lori, the subject of a story about a teacher who lost her temper during Zoom class. <sighs> One of her students had asked if there was an Asian student union on campus, why wasn't there a white student union? Lori shut the student down forcefully and mercilessly. But the kid had screen captured the entire conversation and handed it off to his parents, who promptly posted it to their Facebook page, already saturated with anti-teacher invective. Within days, Lori was getting death threats. A police cruiser parked outside her family's house for a week. I hung up the phone, my insides feeling thrashed around like a boat in a storm. By that point, I started to miss the faceless void of Zoom, where none of this had happened yet. My new normal was living in fear that my attempts to do my job could get my family's faces posted on the internet and a cop car parked outside my home. I chose the path of avoidance when I returned to work the next day. I looked at my students' masked faces and forged on with my regularly scheduled programming. If I just buckled down and did my job, I thought, it would all begin to make sense and feel normal. It was the only thing I could control. Two days later, an emergency staff meeting was convened after school. I logged in to another Zoom call, hoping for some practical tools to process what happened to our colleague. Instead, we were told a student at our school took their own life. Administration told us counselors would be on standby. Then they logged us off. My mind coiled up to protect what was left of me. I didn't know the kid, but my students did. And in less than 24 hours, those students would be back in my classroom expecting me to know what to do. The next day, I looked at my students through plexiglass shields, eyes rimmed with dark circles, Mass tear stains sagging past their noses. The half who were present and not on Zoom looked at me for answers, and I struggled to find the words. I realized my lesson planning, even if it was perfect that day, wouldn't help them process it. A few months later, in April, on the brink of our COVID shutdown anniversary, I heard an all-call announcement instructing teachers to look at their emails. What now, I thought. I tried to keep calm, composure, in front of my curious students, but my cortisol spiked and my hands felt weak as I refreshed my email for the third time. My principal wrote, staff, please make a soft evacuation to the backfields at this time. More information to follow. What the fuck was a soft evacuation? <laughs> Would my students know where the backfields were? My sense of direction was shit on a normal day, so was I necessarily the best person to take them there? I told everyone to grab their things and we joined the flow of students making their way to the back of campus. There was an unsettling silence creeping through the school as we found none of us knew what was going on. Some teachers had enough mind to grab all the evacuation items, including a bucket that functioned as a communal bathroom. I started making a mental list of all the students I would put on latrine duty. Kids and teachers roamed from group to group, sharing whatever information they could find. I huddled with teachers I hadn't seen in almost a year and vetted student theories as to why we were all removed from the buildings we had been so desperate to return to. The dark thoughts faded as I caught up with the people I forgot I missed. 
Apparently, the evacuation had been called because of a bomb threat. I looked at my students, mingling with their friends. For all that they had been through, a bomb threat was very on brand. <laughs> Truly poetic. And honestly, bring it on. Everyone on that field had been forged in the fires of Zoom. Puny threats made us laugh. A buzz rippled through the crowd as everyone got the all clear email. The SWAT team, which in my head was a fully armed SWAT team, was confident the threat wasn't real. After three hours in the sun, we couldn't return to the building to grab our remaining items. The bomb sniffing dogs were busy sweeping the rest of campus just to be safe. As everyone began stirring towards a line of buses, a wayward student asked me what would happen next. I shrugged and told him the only thing I did know. I'll see you tomorrow. When I played junior varsity high school football, I didn't fit in. Literally, I didn't fit in the stuff I was wearing. The day they handed out the pads, they gave me a helmet. First one was seemingly designed for a small child, and the second one made me understand the vice scene in Goodfellas way too well. <laughs> By the time they gave me a third one, the coaches must have realized that I was a third string lineman who hit the wrong person during half the plays. I wasn't going to get much time on the field, and nobody cared about CTE in 2002, so they gave me the biggest helmet they had. It must have been plus size. I looked like I was preparing for the lunar landing. <laughs> Sound echoed in there. But I wasn't a complainer. I wasn't one to upset the apple cart. So I stuck an extra knee pad on the crown and considered the problem solved. I was the backup, backup, left tackle, and this would be my first and last season as an athlete. With only three games left, soon I could turn in my shockingly clean jersey and ill-fitting protective equipment and resume my rightful place as a quiet, relatively smart, good kid who preferred to be in the stands writing about the game for the school paper. Nobody would miss me. I mean, it's not like I was Daniel. I watched Daniel block another defenseman with ease. The kid didn't stand a chance against Daniel. Coaches loved Daniel. I mean, he was the prize of the program. First string left tackle, standing six foot four. He was lean, strong, and hit the right person when told to. <laughs> he was also my friend, sort of. <laughs> Aside from viral internet cartoons like Strong Bad, Simpsons quotes, and the general commonality of adolescent awkwardness, we didn't have a ton in common. And there was also the church thing. Daniel was very religious, to the point that I had stopped swearing around him. He had invited me to services multiple times, and each and every time, I spun through the mental Rolodex of excuses. The ref's whistle blew, game over. I clapped and cheered, even though I had aided in the victory. Uh, not at all. But hey, now there were just two games left. Do you want to come to church with me on Sunday? Daniel asked in the locker room. He didn't even build up to it this time. Uh, 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 no thanks, man. The Rolodex was failing me. And then I remembered I have a driving lesson with my dad on Sunday. Okay, he said, pulling on a shirt. Maybe some other time. Yeah, maybe. I had zero plans of there ever being a some other time. Over my lifetime, my family's relationship with religion had gone from the occasional Sunday to some holidays to maybe on Christmas to no. <laughs> and around this time, in a post-9-11 United States, when George W. Bush's election and first term had seemingly emboldened the entire Christian right with a renewed sense of purpose, righteousness, judgment, and megachurches, my dad's view on organized religion went from tolerant if dismissive to outright hostile. Another mitigating factor, we lived in the Santa Clarita Valley. 
a place best known to any Californian as where? <laughs> and then we'd sigh and say, you know, where Six Flags is. And they'll say, oh. <laughs> Santa Clarita is a little red slice of conservatism and family values. Not that I spend a bunch of time thinking about it. Sure, it was hard to ignore the omnipresence of the Mormon church and the ubiquity of protect our troops bumper stickers and the fact that before every school social function, they papered our hallways with posters banning and warning of the dangers of freak dancing. <laughs> but I had this little piece of paper saying that I had passed the written part of my driving test. Now I just needed to pass the other part, the harder part. And that meant Sundays in an empty, expansive community college parking lot with my dad. In dad's mind, teaching the rules of the road often resulted in hypothetical genocide. <laughs> you just killed another person, he said. His, <laughs> his flat tone at complete odds with the apparent imaginary manslaughter I just committed. I didn't kill anyone. I was too timid to drive any faster than 20 miles per hour, and there was no one else around. I snaked the truck up and down the empty concrete lanes of the lot, stopping at imaginary stop signs and practicing left turns and right turns and causing hypothetical mayhem. You just clipped another car. Again, there were no other cars. <laughs> Driving lessons with dad were a weekend tradition. Lessons first and then errands, groceries, dry cleaning, Home Depot, the suburban trinity. All right, that's enough for today, dad said. I parked the truck and killed the engine. You're getting better. Soon we'll go out on the road and you'll be ready before you know it. As we switched seats, he asked, you want Starbucks? Sure, I said. The other god that reigns supreme in Santa Clarita, commerce. The weekend strip mall is the place to be. This parking lot was not the desolate training ground of my automobile tutorial, not with a Ralph's, a Walgreens, a Blockbuster, and a Starbucks. Light glinted off the windshields of every make and model from SUVs to compacts. The sounds of clattering shopping carts and concrete surrounded us. Dad parked and handed me some cash. You get the coffees and I'll... He stopped, his head cocked up and to the right, peering over my shoulder. What? I asked. Dad has a keen eye for certain things, and this look, something had his attention. Hang on a sec, he said. Before I could ask any more questions, he was gone. Door shut, goodbye. I watched him move through the expanse of minivans and crossovers like a lion stalking through the tall grass. He disappeared behind a Ford station wagon in the distance. Suddenly his bald head popped up again, moving faster, winding in and out like he was ducking tackles, eagerly, failing to suppress a wry smile. Only gone a couple minutes, but here he was, practically giggling. Look what I got, he said. There, in his open palm, lay a cheap piece of plastic. My dad had stolen his first Jesus fish. <laughs> and he was giddy. I pried it off that Chevy, he said. Didn't even damage the paint, just came loose with one flick. He placed it in the change tray. And that's how my dad's newfound hobby began. <laughs> Over the course of the next few months, I'd occasionally check on his secret stash. It grew, adding smaller holy guppies and even one that had a cross where the eyes should be. I didn't know how to feel about dad's collection, even though I agree that Jesus fish are frankly stupid and an empty symbol of faith, I was a rule follower a proverbial good kid who never talked back to teachers, always apologized at the drop of a hat, and car-based vandalism was a foreign concept. Regardless, I had to admit, I thought it was pretty freaking cool. Here was my middle-aged father staging a secret one-man protest in the heart of a conservative small town. C can I do it? I asked him. Sure, he said. Just don't get caught. Thus began a huge crisis of conscience for me. 
because I started to see Jesus fish everywhere. <laughs> Pickings weren't slim in Santa Clarita. Like the swallows of the Capistrano, these little fender flounders migrated to this city as though JC was getting to reenact the feeding of the 5,000. But every time I scoped one out and made sure the coast was clear and practiced my chisel technique, I wouldn't do it. Who cares what's on a person's car? I knew plenty of Christians, plenty of conservatives, and they were fine. Like Daniel. Sure, he loved President W and was the only 10th grader who would parrot Republican talking points instead of South Park impressions. But he was fine. Sure, he could be annoying with his dogmatic beliefs, but he was also dependable and hardworking, and his football prowess had saved me from ever having to back up his backup. He never really even questioned why I wouldn't go to church. I thought we had a mutual respect for each other's beliefs. When the football season was finally over, I decided to celebrate by staying home. I faked some tenuous at best stomach issues. When Daniel called me and asked to come over after school, I thought nothing of it. But when I let him in and he let off with, is anyone else home? <laughs> Something was different this time. His voice, more hushed and serious than usual, made sure the coast was clear. We sat near each other, alone in the house. I know we're very different people, he began, but I have to tell you something. His tone was unwavering and solemn. Uh, everything okay? I asked. Yes, he said. Is there anyone else in the home? <laughs> he asked again. There wasn't, and suddenly I was all too aware of that fact. <laughs> Just he and I, no witnesses. <laughs> I tried to shake it off. I know this guy, he's an okay dude, a little weird, but okay. My dry throat managed to croak out an answer. No. <laughs> Daniel breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, good. I watched his hand disappear into his book bag and my breath caught. I've been spending a lot of time online, he said. Oh, please don't be porn. I really don't want to explain porn to you. I don't even understand it myself. <laughs> a lot of research, he said. Emerging, he held a red report folder. He handed it to me, and it felt light, maybe five pages max. And the first page was just the word confidential, written that stamp version of clip art. <laughs> Daniel's voice remained hushed, so the house was bugged. I have found proof that God exists. What a relief! <laughs> I deflated and sank into the couch. This was just Daniel being Daniel, trying to convert his heathen, technically Catholic, friend to the wonders of his church. Daniel, look, I I'm really not... No, you don't understand, he said, his voice rising. I hear the kids at our school and even teachers talk crap about religion. It's bothered me, but it doesn't anymore because I found this. He reached over and flipped to the next page of the report. There was a poorly cropped and overly grainy image of a black box nestled on a mountainside. Daniel tapped this image repeatedly. Do you know what that is? This is proof that God exists. That's Noah's Ark. Some explorers found it in the Andes Mountains. I was back to being aware we were the only two people in the house. <laughs> Noah? The animals guy? With the, with the flood and the boat and everything? Yes, he yelled, it's there in South America, and someday I'm going to go see it. Now, granted, this was the early aughts, and maybe Daniel had never heard of Photoshop. <laughs> I spoke slowly, confirmed what I just heard. So you believe that you found proof of God because you saw this picture of Noah's Ark on the internet. He nodded. Well, Daniel, uh, I scrambled the Rolodex of excuses spinning like a game show prize wheel. I think my parents will be home soon and they don't really like me to have friends over when I'm <coughs> sick. Uh, maybe we can talk more about this later. He took back his research and I walked him to the door. Before he left, he turned to me. Remember, don't tell anyone. I nodded. And then I promptly told my entire family the second they all got home. 
The entire bizarre moment was strange, uncomfortable, and downright infuriating. Here was a guy who I thought, despite our differences, we understood each other. Someone who I thought is the opposite of me in nearly every way, but we still respected each other. I thought, like me, he'd see past the belief system and recognize that it wasn't about what church he went to or I didn't go to. We could accept each other. But now I saw there would be no tolerance of those who didn't thump the Bible and hide behind religion. There was no willingness to listen to the other side. If they didn't get me with their aquatic-themed bumper jewelry, their total dominance over an entire school system in town, they'd get me one-on-one, -on -one, look me dead in the eye, and tell me that I am wrong and they are right and there's no other way about it. To me, it was their way of saying, you will never belong. Those tiny, gleaming, fake silver car adornments took on new meaning. My dad wasn't just playing a prank. It was defiance in the face of the overwhelming message that said the minority opinion does not matter here. It was the middle finger pushing back against what they thrust in our face. And the next time I was in a crowded parking lot, I saw a Jesus fish. I didn't know if I had the guts to take one yet, but I knew I could no longer be the type of person who didn't speak up when the helmet didn't fit. Thank you so much. Rory Kelly, give him a hand. I was always jealous that I didn't get ham on Christmas Eve. To me, the ham was a glistening symbol of American Christmas, ringed by cherry-topped pineapples and cloves. I'd envision a long dining table big enough for 20. In a warm room that smelled like pine and cinnamon, the sound of Christmas songs quietly playing in the background. Happy pairs of parents beaming while passing around ceramic casserole dishes, while everyone oohed and awed and made unforced small talk. I imagined a perfectly timed laugh track as a mom playfully mussed up her daughter's hair when she dropped food on the white tablecloth. I think this entire idea got stuck in my head after receiving a holiday postcard from my dentist. <laughs> it had a famous Norman Rockwell painting on its front. Uh, it's of a family eating turkey on Thanksgiving. I, however, was an imaginative and precocious child, and this is the image that got stuck in my psyche and warped into some sort of sitcom focused on Americana and Christmas ham. My Christmas Eves were embarrassing to me as a kid. They didn't look much like my postcard. We spent them at my grandma's house, right next door to ours. We'd make the short walk over to her place around 1 p.m., and we would stay there for 12 straight hours. Uh, my grandmother, brought over from Poland as an infant, held on to old world traditions her parents instilled in her as a foreign addition to a new world. She grew up during the Great Depression. She cheerily told me stories of the nuns at her school giving her nickels to run to the corner store to buy them hip flasks of whiskey and packs of cigarettes. <laughs> when I asked her what she did for fun growing up, she once told me that her and her friends pulled up cabbages from their neighbor's garden. Uh, they hit each other hit each other over the head with them until they were scolded by their parents. <laughs> My grandma was so beautiful to me, always dressed impeccably in shoes that matched her outfits and wearing colorful costume jewelry. She put lavender satchels in her dresser drawers so she smelled like them, and she permed her hair into a perfect little cloud. She was beautiful, but as a kid, I didn't think she liked us that much. I already raised four children, she told my mom when she asked to babysit after dinner one Thanksgiving night. I have other plans. What plans, my mom asked. My grandma lived alone. She basically only left her house to run errands. I got some more letters. It might finally happen this year. Mom, Prize Patrol is not going to show up at your house. Publisher's Clearinghouse is a scam. Besides, why can't the kids be there with you if they come? Bevy, they take pictures of you with the big check, you know. 
And to her, that was that, a good enough reason. If Price Patrol showed up on her doorstep, she didn't need any small, dirty fingers staining her big chat. <laughs> we were only welcome at her immaculate house as long as we behaved like proper Victorian-era adults. <laughs> she had exquisite taste. Her living room was filled with relics of my grandfather's time in the Pacific Theater of World War II, ivory geisha figurines and oil paintings and glass dragons. She was so confident that no one would dare stain her white couches, she didn't even bother to cover them with plastic. <laughs> when we got bored, she played polka records for us, but she only let us dance in a small square of rug by the front door. <laughs> Grandma was also a devout Roman Catholic. A portrait of Pope John Paul II, the first Polish Pope, hung above her living room couch in a gold frame right next to pictures of our family. She attended church faithfully. My mom was more of an a la carte churchgoer. She'd pick and choose when she felt like going. The few times we did all go together, I watched as my grandma shuffled up the fading crimson aisle on her knees to receive communion with her tongue eagerly stuck out. Once the priest fed her the wafer, she crawled out of eyesight and hobbled upright. She told us you were supposed to feel the pain in your knees, that the rug burn was a reminder of the pain Jesus felt as he carried the cross on his shoulders for our sins. It was only her and one other old Polish woman dragging themselves down the aisle. <laughs> I was mortified. <laughs> I had aunts and uncles and cousins on my grandma's side, but only my mom, my siblings, and I came to her Christmas Eve dinner. She called it Vilio, and there were rules like, no eating a bite until the first star is out in the sky. We also couldn't eat meat, she said, only fish. I hated fish, especially the way she cooked it with dried out Ritz crackers crumbled on top. I think most of her recipes were from when my grandpa was alive, a time when black pepper was still considered spicy. <laughs> my mother ate slices of pickled herring out of the jar on the table and chased them with shots of vodka. She'd asked them to try it as we gagged. We were ladled bowls of white borscht, a sour rye bread soup with nothing floating in it but mushrooms. There was braised sauerkraut and onions and boiled eggs for some reason, Boil bowls and bowls of them. There were some highlights, thankfully, mostly Polish potato dumplings called pierogies. My sister and I would eat plates and plates of them until we could say we were too full to eat anything else. My mom told us that this was the easy version of Yolio. When I was growing up, we had about nine versions of fish and maybe some boiled potatoes on the side. Uh, your grandma makes all this new stuff for you guys and you should be thankful. New stuff, I think, because I pushed around an egg in my plate. Another Velio tradition was to leave an empty dining chair closest to the door in case Jesus showed up. <laughs> an available seat for Jesus, or a ghost, or a wandering stranger, I guess. One year, the front door rattled in the wind. My mom and grandma both gasped. It's Alan, they said. Alan was my uncle, my mom's oldest brother. He passed away when I was a toddler. My grandma didn't talk about it much, but my mom did. She said he had been her best friend. After the door shook, they swore it was him visiting. They were so happy. I rolled my eyes. It was obviously just the wind. All of my friends had already opened presents while we were just starting on our bowls of borscht. By the time dinner was done, it was after 10 p.m., We'd been scrunching up our noses and poking around at the food for hours, and my mom had single-handedly finished several bottles of wine. When we finally wore out my grandmother's patience, she'd send us kids to the living room. From there, I'd listen to my mom and grandma fight in the kitchen over washing dishes. My mom wanted to help, and my grandmother said she wouldn't do it right. We would listen while we stared at the wrapped presents under the tree and waited for them to finish arguing. Every year you're like this, I heard my grandma say. I knew they were talking about my mom's drinking. It was the only thing I ever heard them fight about. Most of the time, it seemed like they were each other's best friends. My mom was always driving my grandma back and forth to appointments and talking on the phone with her about TV shows and such. But every once in a while, my mom's messiness would collide with, into my grandma's iciness and cause a microburst of conflict. I connected with my grandmother's way of doing things back then. 
She told you what she wanted without shame and people listened. She shoot me a mischievous little wink sometimes when she knew she was being particularly sassy, our little secret. There could be turmoil all around her and she would stay cool. Things in my home were confusing, but when we went to hers, we knew what the expectations were. Though some might see it as a harshness, I found comfort in her sense of self, in her beautiful, clean living room with her breakable trinkets from around the world. I see even more clearly now. Things would have been different had she been born in a different era. She was vibrant and fashionable, and she had a dry sense of humor that would probably kill it now. She clung to her traditions partly because they were what her parents and my late grandfather loved. It was her main connection to her past. When she lost so many people too early all around her, she hardened her armor. She, like so many women from their time, burned their personality away to fit a wax mold they never even asked for. There was no other option for self-preservation. When I was older, I dated a boy whose family just recently immigrated to America from Poland. They followed many of the same traditions I know, but they called it Vigilia, uh, they, the correct word for the Polish Feast of 12 Fishes, not Vilio. When I later Googled Vigilia, I realized that my grandma had made her own version of the feast by cobbling together pieces of the night she cherished as a child. She had moved to America during a time of cultural assimilation. Her parents didn't even want Polish spoken in their home. I asked her about Vigilia. Was her word just a regional variation of that term? But she insisted she had no idea what I was talking about. Right before she passed away, I visited her while she was in hospice care at my mom's house. I sat next to her, she laid in bed, and we watched the birds fly around the bird feeder outside of the window, something she always loved to do. She knew every species and which were male and female from their coloring. She had names for some of them, the bright red cardinals were her favorite. She had a serene little smile on her face as she broke the silence and pointed. That one is an asshole. <laughs> Very on brand. After a while, I asked her if she would tell me some of her Christmas recipes so I could write them down. As far as I knew, she cooked everything from memory. I might have been a bratty eater as a kid, but after I moved 2,000 miles away from home, I immediately craved dishes I grew up with, and there's no good Polish food to be found in San Diego. I especially wanted her recipe for brogis, the dumplings my sister and I shoveled down every year. What's in the dough, I asked. It was so soft and delicate. I had tried using recipes I saw online, but they hadn't come close to duplicating it. Oh, uh, flour, water, sometimes egg, she said. <laughs> Some, sometimes egg? <laughs> uh, yes, you know, sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> when pressed for exact measurement, she didn't have an answer. She knew it felt right, that's what she did. I scribbled down what details I could and I told her I tried to get it right. I know you will do it, she said confidently. She patted my hand and winked and I felt so proud. I think of that empty chair at my grandma's holiday table. I wonder who the remnants of my small family were truly waiting for. My grandfather, my deceased uncle, or any number of departed loved ones. Maybe just a distraction of some kind from our own imperfections. We all made the best of what we were served, but we were loud and messy, and we made it hard for my grandma to keep her protective shield up. Vileo made all of us, even her, very tired. My Christmas Eve now looks pretty different. Shortly after I moved to San Diego, my little sister moved in with me. Her, my husband, and I make a big feast with him, of course. <laughs> We wear comfortable clothes and smoke weed and relax. <laughs> the only challenge we take on is the pierogies. We're going on year five of making them together, around 100 each time. <laughs> We've gotten close to grandma's, but we haven't nailed it just yet. I know we'll get there. <laughs> I also keep an empty chair at my table. At first, it was because the only people I really considered family were my husband and sister. Now I suppose I could include others at my small table, my chosen family and friends. I think I'll always leave one empty though. What if my grandmother shows up? She deserves a seat and I'll offer her our pierogies to try. 
She could open presents before dark if she wants to. She can even have some ham. I bet she'd enjoy it, and she could call our celebration any word she wants. Vamp first timer Jessica Stevens. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let's get one more round of applause for tonight's storytellers. We had Jordan Coburn, Kate McGovern, Kirsten Hernandez, Joe Hudak, Rory Kelly, and appearances by two Vamp first timers, Sarah Sharp and Jessica Stevens. Thank you very much. Now I want to introduce Justin Huddle, the executive director. So say we offer a quick word. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to have you with us on our last show of the year. So we do a ritual um, because this is a church of stories, if you will, non-denominational. All are welcome. And uh, to wrap up the year, we have a very special song that we like to uh, lead off with um, that we feel puts a cap on it and uh, brings us all home together. So please welcome the incredible Kira Vine. Hi, everyone. Oh, all the money that it I spent, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that it I've done, alas, it was to none but me and since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not I'll gently rise and I'll softly call Good night and joy be with you all. Oh, all the comrades that it I've had are sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that it I've had would wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and I'll softly call. Good night and joy be with you all. Good night and joy be with you all. That's our show, guys. Thank you so much for showing up. Give it one more time for Kira Vine, everybody. I also want to thank our wonderful writing coaches this month. They helped all of our performers tonight get their stories into tip-top shape for the stage tonight. So I want to thank Ben Kent, Eileen Zimmerman, Dallas McLaughlin, Eber Lambert, Dustin Markell, Adam Greenfield, and Leon Deckelbaum. And lastly, I want to thank our volunteers for tonight, including Cameron Coleman, Adam Greenfield, Milo Shapiro, Jennifer Coburn, and Brian McGee shooting photos for us tonight. Thank you again. Good night. Happy New Year. Thank you for coming. Thank you.